Why does ending polio matter? Why does ending polio matter? What is happening in Pakistan and Afghanistan? Is Nigeria close to ending polio? Why does ending polio matter? Why is ending polio so urgent? Why do outbreaks happen? What is Rotary doing? What is Rotary doing to end polio? How can I help? How can I help? How can I help? Good afternoon. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. I'm Hannibal B. Johnson, club president, and I'm thrilled to see so many of my fellow Tulsans, fellow citizens here today. As a nonpartisan civic club, the Rotary Club of Tulsa takes seriously its responsibility to the community. Given the web of complex issues that face the state of Oklahoma, the people we entrust with public office may influence Tulsa's well-being for years to come. We've convened this gubernatorial forum so that our leading candidates for the state's highest elective office may share their perspectives on various topics of public interest. This is an opportunity to listen, learn, and grow. Take full advantage. Before I turn the program over to our forum moderator, let's honor a few club traditions and handle a bit of club business. Let's thank our fellow Rotarian and pianist, Tom Wolfe, for our pre-meeting musical interlude. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Thank you. Let's begin our program with a special a cappella solo rendition of our national anthem by Rotarian Phil Armstrong, followed by the pledge, and then an invocation from Bill Miller. Mm -hmm. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land oh, Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please bow with me. Dear God, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for Rotary and for this Rotary Club, for the fellowship that we experience each Wednesday. And we are especially thankful for those in our club who are committed to making our community and our world a better place through service above self. Father, we lift up our nation and our state to you. We thank you for Drew Edmondson and Kevin Stitt and their desire to serve Oklahoma and every Oklahoman. 
Be with them as they work to make our state a better place to live and work and learn. Bless the food that we have partaken to the nourishment of our bodies and bless the hands that prepared it. Amen. Thank you, Rotarians Phil and Bill. Now just a few announcements. Committee meetings. The Club Foundation Grants Committee will meet in room 232 immediately following today's luncheon. Next week, on October the 10th, we will be meeting at Celia Clinton Elementary School, not here in the church. RSVP cards are on your tables. Please let us know if you plan to attend so that we may make appropriate arrangements for lunch. The Tulsa County Election Board needs civic-minded, reliable precinct officials to work the polls for the November 6th election. Volunteers must be registered voters in Tulsa County and will be required to attend a one-day training class. Training classes are scheduled for October the 15th, 16th, 17th, 19th, and 22nd. Applications are available or you may call 918-596-596. 5762. That's 918-596-5762. A book recognizing today's program will be presented to our partner in education school, Celia Clinton Elementary. And this week's book is, appropriately, What's the Big Deal About Elections? <laughs> our Rotarian of the Day and Forum moderator is past President John O'Connor, a shareholder with Hall Estel Law Firm. He practices primarily in the areas of corporate and business law and litigation, and he's been nominated for a federal judgeship. Please help me welcome past president, John O'Connor. Thank you, President Hannibal. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Rotary Club of Tulsa 2018 Gubernatorial Candidate Forum. There are five weeks until a very important election on November 6. We thank each of the candidates for running, for being willing to share their, ta their time and talents with us in the leadership of our state. Um, as has been our past, our, our history, we cover a lot of questions in, this, uh, in these forums, and so this is gonna be a little bit more of an executive summary. We're probably not gonna go too deep on uh, many of them, but we're gonna try to educate each person here on the difference between our two candidates. The candidates uh, have been advised regarding time, and at the, when I announce a question, I'll announce a time for the response. Some of them are very short times, because sometimes they're yes or no type answers. Um, and they've been advised to uh, uh, how much time they'll have. Matthew Bristow is sitting here and he's gonna be running our time clock and we appreciate that. Because of the time constraints, we ask that you hold your applause for a given candidate until the end and then we'll thank both of them for, their, uh, for being here today. We're gonna to start now with uh, introductions of the candidates. We, we flipped a coin for who would uh, open first and who would finish last. So who, had the first, who has the first word and who has the last word? Uh, so um, let me introduce you now to the candidates and give you a little bit of their background. Drew Edmondson's values are rooted in his Oklahoma upbringing. The second son of June and Congressman Ed Edmondson and the nephew of former Oklahoma Governor J. Howard Edmondson, Drew learned the value of true public service early. He graduated from Muskogee High School, attended Northeastern State College in Tahlequah on a scholarship there he met Linda Larison, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Larison, of Fargo, Oklahoma, who he would marry. Upon graduation from college, he enlisted in the United States Navy where he reached the rank of petty officer second class and ser served a tour of duty in Vietnam. While in the Navy, he earned the Joint Service Commendation Medal, National Defense Service Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal, and the Vietnam Campaign Medal. He was elected to the state legislature in 1974. He graduated from the University of Tulsa School of Law. In 1978, he was named Chief Prosecutor for the Muskogee County District Attorney's Office in 1982. 
He was elected district attorney, attorney the same year and served in that position for 10 years. He was elected Oklahoma's attorney general in 1994. Drew was re-elected attorney general in 1998 without opposition and received more than 60% of the vote in his 2002 and 2006 elections for attorney general. He left office in 2011 and has been in the private practice since then. Drew and Linda are proud parents of two children and two grandchildren. And now for Kevin Stitt. Kevin Stitt is a conservative Republican candidate who is running to end politics as usual at the state capitol and to lead Oklahoma with a vision to be top 10 in growth, education, infrastructure, health care, and government efficiency. Kevin Stitt is an Oklahoma entrepreneur and businessman who founded Gateway Mortgage in 2000 with $1,000 and a computer. By delivering strong leadership and vision, Stitt has grown Gateway into a nationwide mortgage company that today employs 1,200 people has 164 field offices in 41 states, and holds a loan servicing portfolio of more than $16 billion. Stitt is promising to bring his proven business experience to state government, where he will put Oklahoma's checkbook online, apply performance metrics, and audit every state agency. Stitt is a fourth generation Oklahoman raised in Norman where his dad was a pastor of a Bible church and spent many summers as a youth in Skiatook, where his grandfather owned a dairy farm. Stitt graduated from Norman High School and worked his way through Oklahoma State University by selling books with the Southwestern Company. Stitt is a man driven by faith and family. He has been married to his wife, Sarah, for nearly 20 years, and together they have six children and live in Tulsa. The Stitts are active members of Woodlake Church in Tulsa. Let's welcome our candidates to the stage. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. We're very pleased that you're with us. Um, and you see Matthew Bristow right down here in front. He's the one, he's the timing guy. So um, let's start today with, with, uh, with the softball. And we'll, we'll uh, start with an open, excuse me, not questions, first opening statements. And um, Mr. Edmondson, you're gonna, you uh, are going to open first. Two minutes, thank you. Thank you. Um, nice to be back. Good to see you all again. I bring you greetings from Club 29 in Oklahoma City. Uh, my wife, Linda, who's taking a picture right now, I would like to introduce, she is here. Uh, we, uh, we, we celebrated 51 years last June, and uh, she's, she's, still, she's still talking to me, so I appreciate that. Uh, I want to uh, confess to each and every one of you that when I left the AG's office in 2011, I did not think I would ever be a candidate uh, for public office again. I kind of lost my filter and started telling people exactly what I thought, which can always get you in trouble. If somebody said something that I thought was particularly stupid, I would say, well, that's pretty stupid. Uh, now I have to say, well, that's very interesting. So. <laughs> So if you say something to me and I say, well, that's very interesting, you know what I'm thinking. Uh, the problem with uh, not being involved is that I can still read. So I'd get up every morning, read the morning paper about something else that's gone wrong in education or health or mental health or corrections uh, or the other functions of state government. And Linda and I would talk about, well, do we need to do this? And finally decided that the answer was yes. So May 1 last year, I launched my campaign for governor of the state of Oklahoma. I've crisscrossed uh, the state talking about those very things, the plight of education, uh, what's happening in health, how we can bring down prison population, how we can save our hospitals from being closed. And I hope we get to discuss those and other issues during the course of this debate. 
Uh, but right now, in opening, I just want to say thank you for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Edmondson. Kevin Stitt. Yes, thanks. Uh, it's an honor to uh, be with you today. I want to introduce uh, my wife as well of 20 years, Sarah Stitt. Thank you for being here, Sarah. And as you guys know, we've been running at this for about 15, 16 months now, and there were 10 people running in the Republican primary. So after we won the Republican primary, it's amazing how the world has changed for me. People are actually returning my phone calls now. <laughs> it, it is amazing. Um, and so, you know, the reason I'm running for governor, I, first off, I, I'm a businessman like a lot of you and employ hundreds of Oklahomans, and uh, we have offices all over the country. And so as I started traveling, uh, to other states. Uh, th this kind of all started happening about three years ago. Uh, I just started noticing all this momentum, positivity, job growth happening uh, when I'd visit my offices in Texas. And then I'd go visit my offices in Tennessee and South Carolina and Colorado, Arkansas. I realized my state has not grown like these other states. And then I really got inquisitive, started looking at um, you know, our education system. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but we're ranked 45th in reading and math scores in the NAOPs, according to all the other, uh, with all the other states. And then we're number one in incarceration rates. So 49 states are doing things better than my state. So that just started really bothering me. And then I really looked at uh, the other nine people running in the race and uh, started looking at the resumes and asking myself, what do we want in our next governor? What's the job of the governor? What's the skill set of the governor? What do we want our governor to do when we get there? And I realized that the people running had the same resume as the old administration and the administration before that. I didn't think anything was going to change if we kept electing the same people. And that's why I decided to run. And I want to take off from my company and focus on the next generation and not the next election. Because to me, you know, we don't have any different issues in our state than any other state in the country. That's why I think we can be a top 10 state in all those different categories. This is about setting a vision and a strategy and going and executing on it. So that's what I'm excited about uh, to be your next governor. Thank you, Mr. Stitt. <clears throat> and the audience is, is pledged to you that they're not going to clap again until we're done. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this first question may or may not be a softball. We're going to start with Mr. Edmondson. Tell us one characteristic that you respect in your opponent. Well, he's tall. Uh, <laughs> no, very, very, very seriously. Uh, I, I, I think Kevin Stitt's commitment to his family is something we can all respect and admire, and uh, I like hearing about it. Thank you, Mr. Stitt. Yeah, well, I was going to say, uh, you know, it's an example to all of us, uh, you know, to be married for 51 years. So uh, I see your wife always with you at all the different events. And I, we actually got out of the car right next to each other and were able to greet the, the Edmondsons when we got here. And so uh, that's uh, something that Sarah and I try, strive to. We can't wait to be celebrating our 51st year of marriage at some point. Great. Thank you both. All right. This next question is for Mr. Stitt first. With Oklahoma's wealth of natural resources, oil, natural gas, wind, solar, water, and with agriculture, manufacturing, aeronautics, defense facilities, and other industries, why is Oklahoma near the bottom of so many measures of economic and social success? You know, first off, we're so fortunate to have the natural resources we do in our state. I mean, other states, if you think about the oil and gas industry, the agriculture industry that we have, other states would die for those industries. So that's what's so perplexing to me is why we haven't diversified and gone after other industries. Um, you know, when you think about in business, what are your strategic advantages? I think about that a lot for the state of Oklahoma. And we have the best location of any state in the entire country. I mean, we're dead center located in the middle of the U.S. So there's no reason we're not number one in manufacturing, number one in distribution, number one in aerospace. We've got to start diversifying and expanding commerce. Uh, but the other reason, you know, we've never really had a correct savings plan. When you think about, uh, you know, we would call it a savings plan in our own personal budget. The government calls it a rating day fund or a stabilization fund. And so I have uh, a PhD guy on staff and I tell him to go back and look back into the 70s. What would Oklahoma need in our savings plan, 
our rainy day fund to actually weather a few of these downturns that we know we're going we're to go through as an oil producing state. Did you know the answer to that was $2 billion? We only need $2 billion from the 70s to weather those storms. The problem is our constitution only allows us to have $1 billion in our savings account. I want to change that. So when we're on an upswing, which we're starting, the oil and gas industry is coming back, and we are actually, the revenue is coming back. We've got a billion dollars in more revenue than last year. And so we need to stabilize in the good times and, and bring some business principles to state government so we don't have to cut core services in five years or 10 years on the next downturn. Thank you. Mr. Edmondson. I think the answer to that is fairly basic. Every time over the last few decades that we've gotten a little bit ahead, we've cut taxes. And this is not a Republican deal. Democrats did it too. And we've got a provision in our Constitution that requires a 75% vote to get revenues back uh, if it's a revenue-raising measure. So what we ended up doing is ratcheting down uh, the funds coming into the state of Oklahoma year after year after year until now we do rank number one in cuts to common ed. We rank number one in cuts to higher education. Uh, we rank in the bottom in our per capita expenditures for students. And we're ranking in the wrong place on too many charts uh, where we're number one in incarceration, number one in teen pregnancies, uh, but we're in the hole on economic development. And I think the answer to that is fairly simple. I heard it from Mike Neal here in Tulsa. I heard it from Roy Williams in Oklahoma City. They both told me similar stories about talking to corporate CEOs about coming to Oklahoma and hearing, why should we invest in Oklahoma when you're not? And the fact is we have not invested in our own people. We have not invested in education, in health, in mental health, in corrections reform, and we are paying the price for it. We have got to turn that train around and start investing in our own people. To follow that, Mr. Edmondson, uh, we'll start with you. In what three key measures of success must Oklahoma be successful? And this is a half a minute, and then we'll go into a little bit greater detail. Okay, the three measures that I would look at are number one, education, whether you're talking about common schools or higher ed. Number two, the health of our people. We've had our life expectancy downgraded in the state of Oklahoma because of health indicators. And number three, I think prison reform is absolutely essential. Too much of our treasure is going into incarcerating people instead of educating people. Thank you, Mr. Sitt. Yeah, you know, number one, uh, there's not one single lever, so you've got to focus on education. We've got to stop the rhetoric that Oklahomans value education. That's why my goal is to be top 10 in education. It's more than common ed. It's also career techs and higher ed, but also infrastructure, number two. We've got to have the best roads and bridges. That's what creates the economy. That's where businesses want to be located. And number three, we're going to set the tone, day one in office, that Oklahoma's open for business. The culture will change as governor. Regulations will work with industry, not adversarially against us. We have got to be the most pro-business friendly state, and then all boats are going to rise. That's going to help our health care. That's going to help education and everything. Great. So now we will go to uh, Mr. Stitt. Let's take your three, education, infrastructure, and, and open for business, and uh, give us a couple of specifics in each of those three areas that you plan to, to uh, make a priority if you're elected. Yeah, so, uh, you know, first off, I like to remind people on education that the, the teachers went on strike in 1968 when the Democrats were in control, and then again in 1979, and again in 1990. We have to pay teachers what market is, competitive wages. It's got to be. When we all in here hire people, we've got to pay competitive wages. So I'm excited. The legislature actually has our teachers now at number two in the region, and I have a plan to get them to number one. But the reason that they keep going on strike is because we keep tying education, teacher pay, to unsustainable revenue sources. Do you guys all remember in here, uh, we're all Oklahomans, that uh, the lottery was going to fix education. The casinos were going to fix education, liquor by the drink, horse racing. We've been told all these things. We've got to structurally change the way we fund it, and that's an equalization formula that we need to address. Uh, we, I don't have time to get into that. They're already hollering at me here. Okay. No, so uh, it's a minute and, and a half. Then, minute and a half. Sorry. Okay, all right. And then uh, 
So, and then, but the other thing I want to say on education, you know, you've got common ed, career techs, and higher ed. Well, here's the deal. Things change over time. Uh, only 45% of our kids are going to college right now, 45%. And I want more kids to go to college, but I'm not going to ignore the 55% that don't go to school because I understand when I meet with business owners, they can't find enough welders or machinists or electricians. There are fantastic careers that our career techs need to be aligned and working with our common ed. Uh, it's so important uh, for us to focus on getting them ready. Apple, Google, uh, IBM has just released. They're not looking for college graduates. It's not a prerequisite. They're looking for computer programmers. We've got to think about that. Sorry. Uh, so I think, Mr. Stitt, you've still got time to address infrastructure and the business. Uh, it's, it was going to be a minute and a half yep. for all three, and I think you've spent about 45 seconds. Okay, good. Uh, you know, on, on business, how do we attract more business? So, you know, we have got to expand commerce. We've got to look where we have an advantage against other states. Uh, so I want to expand commerce uh, to higher tax states. We used to do that. I want to take commerce and put it overseas. I think Oklahoma is the right spot for manufacturing. It's the best place in the country. So there are West Coast companies that need a, uh, a, a Midwest location. There's European companies that need a U.S. presence. Oklahoma is the right spot. We just need a governor that knows how to recruit, knows how to make those phone calls. So I'll address commerce and really expand that. I'm looking for a governor's closing fund, um, and, and we, we can make it happen. But also setting the tone with regulations I think is really important uh, for business. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Edmondson, a minute and a half. What specific actions will you take with regard to education, health, and prison reform? Well, education has to be funded at, at all levels. We can't call on our career techs to solve the problem of business and industry when we're cutting their budget. Uh, we've got to properly fund career techs, colleges, universities, and uh, public schools, uh, pre-K through 12. That's number one. Number two, on education, we can't just say we're gonna fund them. I've offered simple solutions in putting the gross production tax back at 7%, eliminating the capital gains loophole, which will bring in 130 to $180 million, and also putting the other 50 cents on cigarettes that they tried to do in the special session. We need real solutions, not just lip service. On infrastructure, we had two years of billion dollar holes in the budget, the legislature refused to admit we had a revenue problem, so they were stealing money from every pot they could find, including $500 million a year from the Department of Transportation. So now the eight-year rolling plan on highways and bridges is delayed at least 18 months. We've got to put that money back and stop taking money from the Department of Transportation if we want our infrastructure to be structurally sound and progressive. Finally, open for business. We are rated, this is a good news, we are rated among the top five business friendly states in the nation. We have passed the bills that we need to be business friendly. We passed right to work, tort reform, workers comp reform, we did all of those things, but we get the same answer from corporate executives. When you start investing in your people, we'll start investing in Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Edmondson. Okay, we'll uh, go to Mr. Edmondson first. This will be a minute and a half per candidate. Does Oklahoma need more revenue to perform its duties? If so, how much more, and how would you spend it, and then how will you raise it? Well, I think I just answered the second half, uh, talking about gross production tax, capital gains, and another 50 cents on cigarettes. Do we need it? Well, business people across the state of Oklahoma said we did. The Step Up Oklahoma included business leaders from Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Democrats and Republicans who told the legislature we need at least 700 million additional dollars to properly fund education. That's what they were looking at when they came back into special session in April of this year. They were in regular session and special session at the same time. They ended up passing just over $400 million. The provisions that I have called for will raise an additional 300 to 350 million, meeting the target of Step Up Oklahoma. That's also what uh, the One Voice said, the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce and their allies, uh, that we need additional funding for education. I believe that. 
and I think it's essential. So uh, we do need additional funding. That's where I intend to get it. Uh, and I, well, I, I will end there. I won't contrast. I'll let Mr. Stitt answer that for himself. Mr. Stitt, does Oklahoma need more revenue to perform its duties? If so, how much and how will you raise it? You know, I think it's uh, interesting that we're talking about more revenue. There's a billion dollars more in revenue coming in this year than last year. They just increased taxes 400 million the last session. So no, we don't need no, more revenue. We have to reform the way state government is run. Uh, when you think about, we spend 20 billion in our state. Next year we'll have 21 billion to, to spend. If you look at that on the size of a company, that's the size of Southwest Airlines or Halliburton. That's a big institution, about 150th size uh, company in the country. But nobody's accountable. There's no transparency, no accountability. Nobody's actually running state government. Uh, you think the legislature's there in charge, but it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. They only control spending on $7 billion of the overall 20. That means they only appropriate that much. Do you think the executives at Southwest Airlines would put 60% of their revenue on auto draft with no accountability? There's, there's no possible way. So that's why I'm asking for the authority to appoint the agency heads, uh, to have the hire and fire and appointing ability. Because and to, I don't want to be a bad guy, but I want to create the type of accountability and transparency that we're all used to. Until we get there, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at the system, they can never spend enough. We have got to have accountability and make sure we know that those dollars are on target in our education system, in our health care system. And that's what I'll do as governor before we ever go back and ask for more revenue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stitt, the next question you'll start with. Uh, according to one report, Indian gaming revenues in Oklahoma have risen 15 straight years to almost $4.4 billion in 2016. The tribes have paid, uh, paid the state $133.9 million in fees in 2017. When the compacts between Oklahoma and the Indian nations come up for renewal, how will you approach those negotiations? What will be your goals? Yeah, so, you know, I think we're very this fortunate. Is one minute. We, we're very fortunate to have the tribes in our state. Uh, that's another strategic advantage we have. There's federal dollars that come in. Uh, they, there's a lot of employment. There's opportunities for them in aerospace. So love the tribes. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to work together. And I'm going to be a tremendous partner helping them to diversify, employ more people in our state. But just like uh, the tribes or the oil and gas industry or the, uh, you know, it's, what's funny about running for governor, you find out there's like a thousand different industries. You have to talk to everybody in the state. And here's what I tell every industry I go talk to. I'm not going to be the governor just for your industry. I tell them that straight up. I said, I'm going to be focused on what's best for all 4 million Oklahomans. So when we sit down to negotiate, it's always about what is market, what is competitive, what are other states charging. And I'm going to be thinking about you and all 4 million Oklahomans as we're negotiating, whether, wh where, whatever it is, whatever industry, because you have to create a level playing field. And, and that's what I'll do as governor. Thank you, Mr. Edmondson. Under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the state is not entitled as a matter of right to any revenue from Indian gaming. The state of Oklahoma has to offer something in exchange in order to obtain a share of the revenue of Indian gaming. Traditionally, what we have offered is exclusivity. Uh, we will enter into a compact to have a casino here and promise not to uh, compact with another casino uh, nearby. Uh, all also necessary to understand that in the compacts themselves is a provision that the compact, and they all come due in 2020, will automatically re renew and on their current terms unless, as long as uh, gaming is occurring at, um, at the racetrack at Remington Park in Oklahoma City. So we've put some things on the books like ball and dice that would give us some leverage but we have to meet with the Indian tribes and nations on a government-to-government -government basis, talking about what we have to offer and asking what they're able to offer in exchange. We should be able to win an increase in our percent, and I hope we are able to gain additional scrutiny over the slot machines themselves. Uh, but it's going to take tough negotiation by somebody who knows what they're talking about. Thank you. Uh Okay, the next one is for Mr. Edmondson first. 
How would you make state government more efficient if you could do that with one or two decisions? And this is a one half minute. Half a minute. I, I, I think you'd need about six hours to go through that. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot you can do. There's some that I did as Attorney General. We went after ghost employees in the Department of Health. Some of you may remember that investigation. Uh, as Governor, I will team with the Attorney General and with the State Auditor to make sure that every state agency is running as efficiently as humanly possible to root out corruption, to root out any dishonesty, and to make sure our government is lean, clean, efficient, and productive for our citizens. Mr. Stitt. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. Uh, we're going to put a COO in place, a chief operating officer. Then all the 10 top agencies are going to report to that person under my direction. And we're going to be talking about twice a month, key performance initiatives, performance metrics. Once I have the appointment authority to appoint those folks, that's the only way we're going to deliver better services. Folks, I believe in smart government and a government that delivers core services effectively and efficiently. But right now, our agency heads are just spinning everybody in a circle. They spin the legislature in a circle. You can't even get good uh, reporting. Uh, any business person, when you get reports, you've got to be able to trust that data. And I'm telling you, there, there's the appropriated dollars, there's the other dollars, there's no accountability. I'll change that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stitt, you'll go first on this one. <clears throat> Many Oklahomans have to send their children to underperforming public elementary and secondary schools. What specific actions are you going to take in your first 90 days in office to move us toward a fix of this problem? Will you raise teacher pay or benefits? And how will you pay for whatever your changes recommended are? And this is a minute and a half. So, you know, like we said before in the opening, our teachers are now number two paid in the region, and I've got a plan to get them to number one. Uh, but we also have about 2,000 emer emergency certified teachers in our state. It was literally under 100 just as little as five years ago. There's a national teacher shortage. So that's not a Republican or Democrat issue. That's just a, an issue. So as a problem solver, I've also got a plan to recruit teachers. So a couple things on that. I've got $5,000 that I want to match with the local school district so they can get up to $10,000 to recruit teachers and to pay a bonus for new teachers coming into our system. There's also, uh, that we have three tests that we get for certifications in our state. Other states, about 35 other states have, uh, have adopted the Praxis test. I want to move to that test so it makes it fungible for us to recruit more teachers across state lines. Because at the end of the day, we have to have the best teachers in our state. I've got to promote that profession. They have such a tough job. I've learned that on this, on this campaign trail as I've met with teachers and superintendents all over our state. Our class sizes are too big. We've got to invest in that education. We've got to get the right people. The other thing is rigor. Uh, you know, I met with Joy Hoffmeister, who's the state superintendent of schools, and I asked her, how do we get to top 10 in education? And we're one of 17 states right now that has an A-plus rating. She just redid our rigor. Like, in other words, what does a third grader nationally have to know in math or an eighth grader? And she's just rolled that out throughout our organization, and she's asking me for more time to let that take hold. But we've got to have high standards in Oklahoma. Thank you. Mr. Edmonds. When I was going to crime scenes as DA in Muskogee, we often asked whether rigor had set in. Um, we, we have tremendous problems in education, and we're, we're doing well on starting salaries. We're not competing well after five or ten years of teaching, or if you gain a master's, or if you gain a doctorate. That's where we're losing people. That's when they're leaving the profession or leaving the state to go teach somewhere else. That's why we have 2,600 emergency certified teachers this year, nearly 2,000 last year, so it's getting worse. In 2012, it was only 32. But beyond that, class sizes are too large in order to give one-on-one -on -one attention to our students. We have 30% of our schools that no longer teach a foreign language, even though it's still a requirement for admission in most colleges and universities. 20% of our schools have gone to four-day weeks, and I think that is a, a sad case 
uh, if they do that. One superintendent said they did that not so much to save money, but to give their teachers another day in the week when they can work a part-time job at Walmart or somewhere else to supplement their salary so they could continue teaching. That is unacceptable in the state of Oklahoma. We're going to change it. We're going to invest in education. I hope we have a billion dollars next year. I don't think we will. The latest forecast said maybe 800 million. The September forecast was down. The 400 million of that, Mr. Stitt would have vetoed. I hope we have the money, but we need more than that. We have got to invest in all facets of education if we want this state to grow. Let's shift gears for a second. Uh, some bad news, we, 80 to 90% of kids in many school districts around the state qualify for free or reduced lunch signifying financial stress in our homes. We've been told that one in five Oklahoma kids go to bed hungry. How do we as a state become a leader in fighting poverty and eliminating child hunger? Mr. Edmondson, we'll start with you. This is a minute and a half. That's a tough nut to crack. What we can do uh, until we can end poverty, which would be nice, uh, it would be nice if the federal government would raise the minimum wage and the state of Oklahoma could follow suit. It would be nice if we adopted the Medicaid expansion, so 153,000 Oklahomans who work full time uh, but not uh, that earn too much to qualify for Medicaid and not enough to opt into the insurance pool, didn't have to worry about their medical bills and could go to the doctor uh, when they got sick. It would be nice if we could do that. But it gives rise to the fact that when I talk to individual teachers about what could benefit them in the classroom beyond money. I heard things like we need social workers in our schools because our kids are coming to class with problems that we're not equipped to deal with. We need guidance counselors in our schools that can do guidance counseling instead of giving tests and grading tests all day long. We need to be able to fund teaching assistants in our schools to help particularly in challenging lower grades in our classrooms. We need to do all of these things. I believe education is the key to getting out of poverty and we're underfunding education at all levels. We are underfunding it and we are reaping the consequences of doing that. Thank you, Mr. Stitt. You know, that's something that as you, as you run for governor, you, you hear all these stories and you see them and you get to meet the people that are really struggling. And that's what, you know, touches your heart as you're, as you're traveling around the state. Um, you know, the, the amount of free and reduced lunch, I went to Norman High School and now that's, that district gets over 50%. And, and so, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, a lot of this is, uh, uh, you know, there's not one lever that you can pull on this. There's, there's a lot of things we have to do. We obviously have to invest in our education, make sure that our teachers are well taken care of, but also, uh, you know, some of this is a breakdown of the family and how do we get our kid, how do we get parents more involved in their kids? education how do we uh, get get the economy going so uh, people know there's a hope and a future and that's back to making sure that every kid that graduates from high school either goes to higher ed or, or gets a apprenticeship or gets into a uh, career uh, there are fantastic jobs out there I met a guy just yesterday in Oklahoma City an oil field services company and he said straight laborers right out of the gate they're making sixty thousand dollars a year we've got to do that machinists welders can make a hundred thousand dollars a year i've got to start uh, talking to the high school kids get them aligned with the career techs because they're fantastic careers for them also as governor under my health plan one thing i want to do is go to all the different counties every year and bring the community leaders and the nonprofits. We have more nonprofits in our state per capita than any other state. I've got to engage them with some of these social issues and the drug, the drug use, the high school dropouts, the teenage pregnancies. Keating had a marriage initiative that I want to bring back as governor because at the end of the day, that's how we're really going to change this thing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stitt, you'll answer this first. It's a minute and a half. Oklahoma, we're told, is among the 10 worst states when it comes to drug deaths, suicides, and the number of people who suffer from some type of mental health condition. What can we do to address mental health and drug addiction? Well, that kind of ta tags into my, my last one. Uh, 
you know, we've got to, we've got to engage the community together. We've got to start education. Uh, when I go to those 77 counties, my idea is to bring the pastors together, the nonprofits, and because I don't think you can necessarily pass a law in Oklahoma City or Washington, D.C. that changes some of that behavior. We have to start working with our neighbors and get them engaged. That's where real change happens, the celebrate recoveries, the, the women in recovery, and, uh, and get the, the nonprofits engaged in that system. And, it, and as a pastor's son, I know the denominational differences sometimes that divide us, but you know what? We can all rally around the foster care numbers in our counties. And, and I believe when you break your goals down 77 at a time, it's so much easier to accomplish it and move the needle when you're getting those guys uh, engaged in the process. Yesterday, I was in Oklahoma City and, and toured a mental health facility. And uh, we've got to fund the mental health because when you talk about what's happening in our, in our incarceration rates, we're spinning it one way or the other. We just don't have a good vision, a long-term vision, because we keep electing the career insiders and the political elites to lead our state. They won't do anything different because they're always worried about getting reelected. You have to have an outsider and a business uh, set of eyes on these problems to move our state forward. Thank you. Mr. Edmondson. There are certainly things that can and should be done at the community level, at the church level, and I'm totally in support of that. Uh, I've been engaged in some of those myself, uh, working on the board of the uh, State Asso Mental Health Association. But I think it's also critical to pass what the Department of Mental Health had proposed eight years ago, and that's the Smart on Crime proposal that would put drug, alcohol, and mental health facilities within the reach of every Oklahoman across this state. That's the key uh, to preventing somebody from committing the crime that will send that person to the penitentiary. And keep this in mind. Uh, if we want to keep a tight pocketbook, uh, it costs three to $5,000 to treat somebody's underlying problem of drugs, alcohol, or mental health if there's a facility available and we can get them into that facility. It costs twenty to $30,000 to lock somebody up for a year. So being number one in incarceration in the nation, which by the way makes us number one in incarceration in the world, uh, is not an economically feasible way uh, to treat those among us who have drug, alcohol, or mental health problems. It would be much more advantageous to treat those problems before the crime is committed in order to reduce prison population, and that's our end goal. Thank you. Uh, this next one will be one minute, and it plays off comments that both of you have made. We'll start with Mr. Edmondson. Uh, we do not want to be number one in the states, uh, among the states in incarceration rates. What are we going to do about that? Well, I would reiterate that uh, passing the Smart on Crime proposal is a good first step, treating the underlying causes of criminal activity before the crimes are committed. Uh, we need to also look at other categories of crime that we might treat the same way as we did uh, simple possession of drugs uh, when the state passed State Question 780 and said, from now on, we can punish that, but it's not going to be penitentiary eligible. We can take other crimes like that, bogus check, for example, or shoplifting, and say, okay, if you're caught uh, two or three times uh, or the first time, you're going to be punished, uh, but we're not going to send you to the penitentiary. We're not going to spend $20,000 of our money to keep somebody from writing a $50 bogus check. That just does not make sense. So make them eligible for county jail time, make them eligible for work release or other things like that, but take those categories of crimes and make them non-prison eligible. Thank you, Mr. Sitt. So, uh, you know, I went with the district attorneys and, and they have a very tough job. So we are gonna be smart on crime, but right now we incarcerate more people than any other state. So we are doing something wrong. Uh, you know, when you think about the three strikes and you're out for the nonviolent drug offenders, we incarcerate those folks uh, much longer sentences than the other states around us. But back to the district attorneys, you know, they have a tough job, and I support the district attorneys and our first responders, and I, we have to respect our law enforcement. Public safety is number one. 
But the way, I've got to look for alternative funding. Uh, that 50% of the funding from the, uh, in the uh, district attorneys comes from fines, fees, and court costs. That's the other thing that's kind of gotten away from us. And so we are incarcerating people uh, that with, with, with fines. I've got a, I've got a friend that uh, has a roofing company right here in Tulsa, and he incarcerates people. I'm just... <laughs> you got to give me 30 more seconds on that one. I, I don't have, I got to finish this story. Anyway, uh, he employs people that have been incarcerated, mostly drug-related, and he said they're good guys. And he goes, uh, you know, but he has to give them payroll advances all the time. Just last week, one of them came to him and needed $800 or he was going to get reincarcerated when he met with his parole officer. This is a person that you're bumping into at 7-Eleven or Quick Trip. They're paying their taxes, swinging a hammer. We're not afraid of them, but we're going to get reincarcerated for an $800. We've got to change that funding mechanism so there's no self-dealing there. All right, thank you. On this one, we will start with you, Mr. Stitt. Uh, this is a half minute. Do you support legalizing recreational marijuana in Oklahoma, and why or why not? Absolutely not. It, it, it's still illegal federally. That would put our state in too many unintended consequences. The business owners I talk to, as they try to have a safe work environment, how do they drug test? Trucking companies, as they're shipping across state lines, uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole world of problems with that in the banking system. It's illegal federally. It's got to stay illegal until they do something federally. Now, recreational, I'm fine with. If it's going to help somebody, uh, then everybody's fine with that. As I've traveled the 77 counties, people are okay with, uh, recre with uh, medical. medical. Sorry. Well, you want another extension on that? <laughs> Can I have one? <laughs> no. No, I think we all know what I you am meant. Not against, I, I do not like recreational. I'm okay with medical. I, all right. Kevin, I knew okay, what you meant. Okay, Mr. Edmondson, I, I do you want to clarify where you are on this? Yeah. I'll be very careful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did vote for the uh, medical marijuana, and I cautioned when they were, they were talking about circulating a petition back then, and I was asked my view on it, and I said, we have an opportunity in Oklahoma to look at what's happening in Colorado uh, look at what's happening in Oregon and Washington and learn from the mistakes of others uh, before we jump into recreational uh, marijuana. Uh, we know Colorado's getting $400 million in revenue from that, uh, but uh, as Kevin pointed out, they've got real problems with federal banks that are paying it in cash, and that uh, is a problem. So wait and see on recreational. Okay, great. Now. Uh, we have five state questions that we all are going to be voting f on on uh, November 6. We'd like to know your all's thoughts on these, and uh, these are going to be quick, just 10-second uh, type responses. But um, we'll go through the state question 793 deals with um, the rights of optometrists and opticians and the legislature's uh, authority to impose health and safety standards. Uh, Mr. Edmondson, we'll start with you, and this is a, a quick, this is what we call the short in the opening. I, I, intend, to vote, I intend to vote aye on that one. Uh, I've always been consumer oriented, and I think this is good for consumers. Uh, make your own choice, but I intend to vote aye on that one. Yeah. Mr. Stitt. Yes on it. Yes. All right, great answer. <laughs> All right, state question 794. This measure would add to our Constitution several new rights for crime victims, the right to be notified about proceedings in the criminal cases they're involved in, to be heard in most of the court proceedings on their case, and to receive uh, restitution and speak to the prosecutor. That's question, state question 794. We'll start with Mr. Stitt. Yes. Okay. <laughs> You'll be elaborate or No, what? no, no, don't need to. We're happy. Uh, Mr. Edmondson. Yeah, that's Marzi's law. I intend to vote yes on that. All right. State question 798 is a constitutional amendment which would require the governor and lieutenant governor to run together on one ticket beginning in the year 2026. This one we go first to Mr. Edmondson. I intend to vote aye on that one. Uh, I, I'm going to watch. It, it's going to take legislation. I want to make sure that the governor candidate gets to pick who he's going to run with or she's going to run with, but I intend to vote aye on the measure. Yep, Mr. Stitt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, 
I'm going to be working with the team, and I can't imagine having somebody that you wouldn't want to work with, and there's going to be an opposite parties trying to work as lieutenant governor because they need to be part of the team. We've got to be moving this thing together. Okay, Mr. Sitt, we'll start with you on state question 800. This constitutional amendment would create a trust fund known as the Oklahoma Vision Fund. Uh, Five percent of collections from the gross production tax on oil and gas would be deposited into the Oklahoma Vision Fund. Are you for that or are you against it? And, if, and briefly, why? Yes, that's back to making sure that savings account we talked about earlier, that we get $2 billion in it instead of just $1 billion, and so we don't have to cut core services. That's important. That's something that we need to do to, to set our state up for success 50 years from now. Thank you. Mr. Edmondson. I have not made up my mind on that one yet. Uh, I need to study it some more. Uh, I'm familiar with it, but I need to know more uh, before I decide how I'm going to vote on it. All right. Thank you. Uh, state question 801. We'll start with Mr. Edmondson. This constitutional amendment would allow school districts to use some property tax dollars for teacher salaries and operating expenditures. Are you in favor of that or opposed to it? I haven't talked to a single teacher, administrator, principal, or anybody else involved in education who is for that. I intend to vote no. Mr. Stitt. I'm absolutely for it. That is so important to get our state on the right direction. What it does is it takes the handcuffs off the local school districts to allow them to use dollars in the classroom or for infrastructure. So that's all it does. It just opens up the dollars that are already there to take the handcuffs off that local school districts. Very important. Okay, uh, this one comes down, the, the uh, conservatives would call this uh, uh, pro-life, the, the liberals would call it reproductive rights. Uh, when does a, a human become a person entitled to protection under the Constitution? And Mr. Uh, Stitch, you go first. Uh, I believe that life begins at conception, and I'm pro-life, and I'll protect life uh, in our state. Mr. Edmondson? Well, it just philosophically, medically, and legally, I'm not competent to answer that. I, I support the trimester division of Roe v. Wade, uh, where the viability of the fetus as it increases is entitled uh, to increasing rights. Okay, um, I have one more, and this is a quick one, but um, it, it appears that that maybe some of the, the uh, people opposed to Mr. Stead are going to uh, refer to him as a, as a different version of Mary Fallon, and that some people opposed to you, Mr. Edmondson, are going to try to associate you with Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. How, how let me ask you, we'll start with you, Mr. Edmondson. How are you different from Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders? 25 seconds. Jeez. Uh. In the first place, I'm running for governor of Oklahoma, and neither Hillary nor Bernie ran for governor. Uh, I'm concentrating on Oklahoma issues, and neither one of them concentrated on Oklahoma issues. Uh, I'm in favor of growing the state of Oklahoma, and neither one of them had a, any particular drive to grow the state of Oklahoma. So those would be the major differences. Great. Mr. Stitt, how are you different from Governor Fallon? Well, you know, Besides being a male versus a female? Yeah, that's good. I think we can get past that. So, uh, you know, I, here's the deal. Uh, I'm so much different. I mean, I've come from the private sector. I know how to, I know how to set strategy and lead and, and uh, move, get the wor legislature working towards a common goal. I think that's what, our gov what we need in a governor. I've never been in the pol political world, never ran for office before. Uh, just think of the world totally different than the career politicians. Great. Okay. Now, Mr. Edmondson, you will give us a two-minute closing statement, and then Mr. Stitt. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I want to use part of my two minutes to expound just a little bit on the, uh, the amendment allowing millage to be used for operational costs and not just uh, structural costs. Uh, the reason educators aren't for that are several. Uh, not the least of which is they believe the legislature will use that as a cop-out in future years, saying if you want more money for your teachers, go pass a millage or increase uh, your property taxes. Uh, also, I think it will increase the disparity uh, between districts that is already uh, pretty much of a problem in the state of Oklahoma. 
So that's why uh, I am not in favor of that uh, particular amendment. I don't think it helps any, and most school districts on the five mills that they can use for building funds and things of that nature are already tapped out. They're already using uh, all five of those mills, so that is not increased funding for education at all. Uh, so with that being said, uh, again, thank you for inviting me to be here. I think this has been uh, very helpful, uh, at least uh, to both of us, uh, to hear the positions of our opponents. I enjoyed uh, the opportunity to visit with some of you, and I hope to visit with others before this day is over. Uh, we are at a very critical juncture in the state of Oklahoma. We will make a decision on November 6th uh, whether we're going to continue the same tired policies of the last eight years that got us into this problem or whether we're going to switch directions, start investing in our own people, start improving our educational product, start building a state, capitalizing on our assets and our resources, building a state that our children and grandchildren will want to live and work in, and building a state that those children and grandchildren can be proud of. I look forward to that task. I take it on wholeheartedly, and I believe every bit of it can be accomplished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Edmondson. Now, Mr. Stitt. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, Mr. Stitt. Thank you guys so much for, for having us here. It's such an honor. Uh, I've been running at this for the last 16 months and traveling all over our state. And people are, you know, uh, people are tired of coming in last place. They're tired of the stats. They're tired of us not competing with other states around us. And that's what I get excited about, folks, is I believe we can be a top 10 state. I don't think we have any different issues in our state than they have in Tennessee or Colorado or Texas. We have had some mismanagement and some leadership issues, and I am excited to get in there and, number one, end politics as usual. You know, I'm going to shine a light on the, on the, on the uh, self-dealing that happens in politics. We've got a structural problem that I want to change. And then secondly, we've got to take advantage of what's happening nationally. We have the national economy is starting to boom. We need a governor that understands pro-business principles, how to get our economy growing again, how to expand commerce. We are right on the cusp of doing something special in Oklahoma. And then the third thing is we've got to reform the accountability issues and how we are structuring state government. When we talk about the, the spending $20 billion, I'm telling you folks, uh, like last year, you remember the Department of Health lost $30 million. Then they robbed from the, the county road and bridge fund to fill that need. We have some structural issues and an alignment issues that I want to change in state government. It'll put us on a tremendous trajectory over the next, uh, over the next 50 years. So that's what I'm excited about to lead. This is not rocket science. This is about blocking and tackling, setting a vision, and going and executing on it. And so if you want to be top 10. Uh, I need your support on January 6th. It's going to be a, a close race November 6th. Gosh. <laughs> Gracious. November 6th. I need your support on November 6th uh, to win this thing. So thank you guys so much for being here. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just looking forward to working with each and every one of you. Now let's show our appreciation. <laughs> All right, thank you all. President Hannibal, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you all for coming out for what was, I think, an insightful um, and informative discussion on important issues. We are adjourned. <laughs>